Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Stuttering Awareness. Thank you for joining us. We have wonderful panelists with us this afternoon, and this is, will be a very informative event. Just a couple administrative notes before we get started. My name is Pira Wilner. I'm a speech language pathologist and the speech language pathology clinical specialist at Simple Practice. This event will be recorded. Everyone who is registered will receive an email with the recording of the live event of the full event tomorrow morning. So if you hear something today and you want to hear it again, you can listen in tomorrow. Make sure to keep an eye for the same email you use to register for this webinar. This is our schedule for today. We're going to introduce the speakers, answer some pre-submitted questions, and then some final thoughts. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Martha Horrocks is joining us today. Martha, will you please tell us a bit about you and your work? Sure, so I'm a Maine-based speech-language pathologist, as it says there. Um, I own my own private practice um, here in Maine and work with pediatric clients. I love fluency, particularly working with kids who stutter, um, and I'm fortunate to do that in my practice. Before I was a private practice SLP, um, I worked in the school, so some school-based um, experience as well. Excellent. Welcome, Martha. Thank Our you. Next panelist is. Dr. Scott Yaris. Scott, will you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your work? You bet. Uh, thanks, Pera. Uh, my name is Scott Yaris. I'm a professor at Michigan State University. Uh, I'm also the president of Stuttering Therapy Resources. Uh, all of my work, my entire career has been about stuttering, so uh, I'm delighted to have this chance uh, to talk with you folks about stuttering. Um, I've been a practicing speech language pathologist, uh, had a private practice for just shy of 30 years now. Again, only, only working with stuttering, it's all I know. And so any day I get a chance to chat with folks about stuttering is a good day. Uh, today and tomorrow with International Stuttering Awareness Day, good days. Fantastic, welcome Scott. We're so happy that you and Martha are here today with us. So I wanna dive into our pre-submitted questions. Our first question comes from Tanya. And the question is, what causes stuttering? Scott, would you take this question? And Martha, you can add on anything after. Sure. Right. Am I allowed to use the the this uh, emoji? Uh, so <laughs> no. <laughs> for a long time, for a long time, um, we really didn't know. We had a lot of ideas. And if you look at the history of our field, there have been many, many different ideas presented about what might cause stuttering. Uh, but just in recent years, uh, we've just made tremendous strides as a field in improving our understanding of what is underlying stuttering. And today we can say with some certainty that we have some pretty good ideas about at least factors that contribute to stuttering. We wouldn't say anymore that there's any single cause to stuttering, but rather we'd look at multiple factors that interact with one another. One of those factors is uh, interactive in and of itself, and that's genetic factors. We know that there is some type of genetic factor underlying the development of stuttering. We don't fully understand it yet. There's great research being done on understanding it, but we know that those genetic differences that we see in many people who stutter lead to neurological differences. We can say with certainty today that the brains of people who stutter are different from the brains of people who stutter. Stuttering is not a learned behavior. It's not just a habit. It's not something people pick up. It's not just anxiety. It's not a psychological problem, but it ultimately arises due to differences in both neurological function, which we might have guessed because the behavior is different, so the brain is functioning differently, but also neurological structure. And again, there's great research being done uh, uncovering new new findings. Uh, I mean, every journal issue, there's something new that we're learning about the differences in the brains of people who stutter. So we would say stuttering is a neurodevelopmental condition, something different about the development of the brain. All right. Anything that was a pretty thorough, yeah, that was a pretty <laughs> thorough explanation. But I think the only thing I would add is it is okay that we don't have a cause yet. I think it's okay to say it's a combination of factors. I think I'm thinking of 
people who are new to private practice, new as SLPs, I think we can be okay with the fact that we don't have that definitive, it is caused by this, that it's a combination of factors. And let me speak to all the different factors that are involved. And I think that kind of puts parents at ease as well. Like we're all in this together, we're all figuring out and it manifests differently in your child. And I think, I think it's okay to say that. Excellent. Thank you. Can I amplify that? What a great um, uh, point, Martha, because, you know, we don't know what causes articulation disorders either, but that never bothers us. So it shouldn't bother us so we don't understand stuttering, you know, stuttering's origins, uh, but we're learning more and, and yeah, that helps to put people's minds at ease. Great point, excellent. Our next question is from Marta. And the question is, if a child is unaware of their stuttering, how do you go ahead and address it? And this is definitely something that's come up in therapy sessions for me or evaluation sessions. So um, Martha, could you speak to this? Sure. So I think this is where we can be kind of a detective. We should observe the child. Let's say that they're in our therapy room, they're stuttering, but they don't seem aware. But do you see any other physical symptoms? Like, is there some eye blinking or um, are they moving when they're speaking? I think those are little clues that they are, there is some awareness because they've added a behavior to try to get to try to communicate what they're trying to say. And so I think using little clues to help inform us um, of what we should do next is really important. I think I, I'll reference my fellow panelist here when he said that um, you won't make a child worse by acknowledging that they stutter. And so you really shouldn't be afraid if there's a child stuttering in your room to say, hey, I noticed something when you're talking. And you don't have to say like, I noticed stuttering, but, but don't be afraid to use that word. You can use the word stuttering in your room because there is there shouldn't be a stigma attached to it. It's just the way that people talk. And so if you talk about, hey, your voice does really interesting things, let's talk about it, let's play with it. Then you're building this awareness around this is the way I talk and that's great. Like that's just me. And so I, I don't think there's anything to lose working with a child who is unaware or really, really unaware of their stuttering by learning about their voice, learning about the speech mechanism and playing. Yes, thank you for bringing that up because for sure families, parents will be concerned about bringing attention to it and thinking that it's going to make make it quote worse if they talk about it. Scott, anything else to add on that? It's really, it's one of my favorite topics because for so long we've had this fear of bringing attention to stuttering and all of that fear that we've got as a field, I mean, it, it's palpable, all traces back to a theory that nobody actually believes anymore. It was all this idea that if you talked about stuttering, it was gonna make the child feel bad. And I guess, I mean, if you talk about it in a mean way, you could hurt somebody's feelings, right? But nobody, nobody is doing that. If we are instead supportive as we talk about stuttering and open about it, and if we convey to the child that there's nothing to fear here, there's no, nothing to feel bad about, then that whole issue of awareness that we have spent so much time and energy worrying about as a field, we can just let it go. It's okay to create awareness in a child. Think about it like our tick therapy. I mean, you have kids come in all the time who don't realize that they're interdentalizing their S. We never hesitate to point it out. In fact, we'll do auditory bombardment, we'll do placement training, we'll show them a mirror, we'll stick stuff in there. But think about stuttering like that. It's, yeah, oh, hey, you do that. No big deal. And a lot of it has to do, just as Martha said, with how we convey that right? It's nothing to be afraid of. It's nothing spooky or mysterious. It's nothing bad. Just, oh, I noticed that. And when we approach it that way, then the kids get the chance to approach it that way. And that helps to prevent the development of fear. The reason people said don't draw, uh, draw attention to stuttering was to try to prevent fear from developing. That was from the 1950s. We've got better ways to do it today. <laughs> For sure. Thank you. <laughs> Question number three. It's from Kristen. What ideas do you have for raising stuttering awareness? And Scott, why don't you take this one first? 
talking to everybody everywhere all the time about stuttering. That's <laughs> um, well, we have this great opportunity with International Stuttering Awareness Day. There are people all over the world doing events related to stuttering right now. Um, but we, we shouldn't limit it just to October 22nd. And in fact, we don't. Within the stuttering community and those who are concerned about stuttering, we spend the whole month of October. Okay, we have conferences, we do, you know, um, uh, social media things, but really the more we can be open about stuttering in general and not treat it as something that needs to be hidden, then that in and of itself is going to make a difference in stuttering awareness. Again, for a long time, our field thought that talking about stuttering was a problem. And so people learned to not talk about it. I mean, there are people today who are afraid to say the word, you know, that word, stutter, 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 stutter. It's okay to say, right? <laughs> but for a long time, people were, were really taught, you shouldn't say it, shouldn't talk about it. That's why we talk about disfluency or fluency cases, when really what we're talking about is stuttering. So the more we're open about it, the more we use the word, the more we talk about it, that helps to reduce that societal stigma by increasing awareness. Um, and that's something that we can all play a role in, whether we're specialists or not, we can all play a role in that, letting people know that it's okay to talk about it, uh, that, that can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Martha, anything else to add? I think so this year I've been really thinking about when you hear of an awareness day, like International Stuttering Awareness Day, you think like, oh my gosh, I have to do something. Like I need to put a flyer in my private practice waiting room or I need to, you know, whatever, whatever it is, send an email blast. This year I've been really thinking about the fact that I'm always growing my awareness. And so looking for opportunities where I can better myself. I mean, and I know some of you are here today listening to us, but the work doesn't stop. I know Scott probably is always learning too. And so thinking about how can you take that day to maybe set aside some time for a CEU or, or even better, take some time to listen to someone who stutters, tune into a podcast, follow them on social media. There's amazing people creating amazing things out there. And I think that just helps our awareness. I'm not a person who stutters personally. Um, and so making sure that I'm taking time to connect with those who are really the true experts on stuttering and the people who, who stutter um, and using that as an opportunity to, to better my own awareness on these kinds of days. Excellent, yeah, I was thinking back, my mom used to work in the juvenile um, judicial system and she would tell me about having juveniles come in who stutter and I was able to raise her awareness of stuttering and share with her how to communicate and, it made such an impact on her. And then she was able to share that with her colleagues. And just this idea that stuttering is something people do when they're talking. And it's, you need to talk to them like you're talking to everyone else and right. <laughs> keep eye contact. And she really appreciated that. So I think having conversations with people outside of the field of speech language pathology is also really mm -hmm. important about stuttering. Yeah. All right, our next question is from Paula. And Paula asks, what should we do when parents want their child in speech therapy for stuttering, but the child doesn't want to participate? Scott, is this another one of your favorite topics? Oh, it is, because it's one that comes up so often, right? Uh, because there's a lot of reasons that a, a kid might not want to be in therapy. I mean, we're fun people. We speech language pathologists, right? Everybody should want to hang out with us, but not when they're kids. There are a couple of reasons that children might not want to be in therapy. There's a, there's a more positive reason. There's a more negative reason. More positive reason is that maybe the kid is actually just fine and doesn't need to be in therapy. Many students will go through a period of time when they're, they're coping well with their stuttering. They're not held back. They've got friends, they're talking. Although they may sound like they're stuttering a lot to a listener, to them, it's not getting in their way. And I would say that that child 
actually doesn't need to be in therapy if there's no adverse impact on their lives. But if the parent doesn't understand that, they'll say, oh, he's stuttering. You better get him in therapy because you got to make him stop. Mm -hmm. In that case, we have to help the parent understand the reason we do therapy for stuttering. It is not to stamp out the stuttering. It is not just to focus on that fluent speech uh, because the kid doesn't need therapy just because he stutters. If he has adverse impact, well, then we want to work on that. But if I can tell a parent, look, I've assessed this. He has no adverse impact. He's speaking freely. He's saying what he wants to say. He's doing what he wants to do. He's great. What would I work on? Right? Then we have to educate them that it's more than just fluency. That's the good reason. The tougher reason is a child who's not ready for therapy, who's really struggling, who is experiencing adverse impact and is hurting so much that they just can't acknowledge being there. And in that case, they really do need our help, but they may need our help in a very gentle way to begin with. And one of the things that, that I, uh, I emphasize for this group is don't hesitate to spend a lot of time Simply building rapport, that's all time really well spent because they won't, don't, don't worry about moving on to technique. Don't worry about moving on to uh, attitude work. If they're just barely able to be in the room with you because of their discomfort, then that in and of itself is enough. To, they can take their time. More often than not, it's this other one. But do be aware that sometimes kids are just, it's hard, stuttering's hard, stuttering's hard. And if the parents don't understand that, then they're going to be recommending sort of the wrong thing, right? They're going to be pushing for the fluency when really what the child needs may not be that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Martha, anything to add? I was just thinking that when this happens in my private practice, usually it's kind of not a, not a red flag, but it's a flag. It's there's a, there's a, hey, we need to touch base. And it's a time to really reconnect with the parent um, and reconnect with the child if, like Scott said, they're, they're willing to talk um, or willing to participate and engage. But usually for the parents, it's a time to say, okay, where are we in our goals? What goals do you have for the child? What are your hopes? You know, like the child doesn't want to participate. What do you hope that they'll do? Um, what are you seeing at home? What's um, happening at school? Are there things going on that, that I can be supportive with? And so it's kind of one of those moments where you are thinking, I need to make sure that I'm reconnecting with the parents. Maybe something's um, gotten off track with the parents and I, I need to reconnect. That was the only, the only thing I could think. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering, I have a blog post specifically on this topic. Is it okay if I drop it in the chat while you're? Yes, absolutely. Okay, I was also thinking about the OASIS and using that mm -hmm. tool to really figure out where a client is in their journey and in their their openness to therapy. Um, what, just off the cuff, what is your favorite rapport building activity to do, Martha, in these cases? Do you have something in your back pocket that you like to do? I don't know that I have like a, a, a like go to this website and use this thing, but I think this is always a time to, and I'm thinking of Eric Raj here, to flip the script and be like, what are you interested in? Let's talk about that. Like the stuttering thing, let's put aside for a minute what are you interested in what like how does that thing work whether it's like video games or i don't tick tock or whatever it is and tell me how it works what do you like about it what do you enjoy about it? and see if we can just connect on some level or you teach me something i've been you know trying to talk with you you be the teacher and give them sort of that power and control and that i can model for them like i'm listening i'm here to listen I, I want to hear you talk. I want to hear you communicate. And that's always a good way of bringing in their interests to help really help build their rapport right away. Excellent. Scott, anything in your back pocket that you like to use? Well, it's actually very similar to what Martha said. I, I, the, the less I talk in a session, you know, the better. And I tease that I live my life vicariously through my clients because they're out doing fun things, you know. <laughs> so whatever the kid's interested in, I know more about video games, you know, than 
I, I, if I ever get a chance to play Minecraft, I'll know how to do the whole thing because they've told me everything I need to do. <laughs> or we just we just open it up and we just do it together, right? And so whatever they're interested in, I'll probably find some interest in. I, I've never actually had somebody that I worked with where where they didn't have something interesting, you know, that I could express genuine interest in that they were telling me about. Yeah, excellent. All right, question number five. Would you, uh, Angelica wants to know, would you explain the concept of verbal diversity and how it relates to our work with clients? I recently was in a CEU course that Nina Reeves was the facilitator and she spoke about verbal diversity and I, I think this is such an important concept. And Scott, would you share about, about it? You bet, you bet. Now, if, if Nina were here, I would want to defer to her, of course, because um, so Nina is my my business partner through Stuttering Therapy Resources and my co-author on the books and things that, that we've written together. And uh, we've done a lot of work together over, over well, more than 20 years now. Um, she, she texted me one day, we're, we're in daily contact. She texted me one day. She said, what do you think about this idea of talking about stuttering as verbal diversity? Do you think that's a good phrase? And I just kind of exploded, like, oh, my God, yes, you've got to go. Do, do, do. And so I text her back. We've got to get on the phone. we got to start talking about that. And that's what led to that SLP Summit presentation that she did mm -hmm. uh, and the blog posts that she's put on Stuttering Therapy Resources uh, is, is her um, uh, just perfect turn of phrase of recognizing that people speak differently. And that that's okay. Uh, and as our field of speech language pathology has begun to come to terms with the fact that uh, although we were taught once upon a time that what we're supposed to do is work on differences, I'm uh, sorry, work on disorders, and it used to be worse because in, at one point we were speech defect teachers, right? Mm -hmm. We've gotten a little bit better in our language since then. Uh, our field is also grappling with the idea that uh, no, not everything that we work with um, should be considered a uh, disorder uh, and that we don't need to be labeling people and differences as disorders. We can instead help people come to terms with their differences and accept that their differences are okay and lead the way in that. That's really where I think that we as a field have an important role to play, is leading the way in helping people understand that, yes, just because somebody produces their speech differently, that doesn't mean that it's bad or that it needs to be stopped. Sort of a pet peeve of mine. It doesn't apply just to stuttering, right? I mean, you'll so hear people say, oh, that person has a, has a, did you hear their S? Oh my goodness, I can't. And I want to just say, well, wait a minute. Let's take a step back and, and ask if that's who we want to be as a field. Yes, there are people whose method of our, the manner of articulation gets in their way and they want help with it. Great. We can help with that. But we don't need to be highlighting those differences as problematic. So thinking about verbal div diversity as it relates to stuttering is recognizing that some people's speech will have stuttering in it. That's just the nature of how their brains are. We started talking about brains. That's the nature of how their brains are and that that's okay. And we have to model in our behavior, in our words that we choose, in the way that we approach therapy, in our writing, that we truly believe that it's okay. People who stutter are not doing anything wrong. They just have different brains. And in embracing that, we have the opportunity to make a real change in how we talk about what we do as a profession. Um, of course, the autism world is, is grappling with that. The stuttering world is grappling with that. And I think other areas of our field are going to grapple with that as well and should because differences are okay. Absolutely. Actually, would you speak to, we have people who are listening in who aren't speech language pathologists, would you share what stuttering is, the different behaviors um, that make speech different for someone who stutters? You bet. Martha, do you, I talked on the last one. Do you want to grab that one or? Okay, keep going. I just want to be You're fair. On a roll. Okay, I just <laughs> want to be fair because, you know, once you wind me up and I was, so. Um, I'm good. I'm yeah. Happy. So I want to think about what stuttering is in a couple of different ways. 
most of the time, what listeners interact with when they're thinking about stuttering is certain behaviors in speech. The most common re behaviors being a repetition of a part of a word like that, or a prolongation where a sound is stretched out like that, or a block where nothing's coming out at all. Okay, those are the behaviors that people will typically see in a person who stutters, as well as attempts to cope with those behaviors like tension, struggle, forcing words out. But all of that is based on what a listener might notice, right? Most of the definitions of stuttering that have been offered over the years focus on those listener observations. But what our field is doing now more and more, and what, what's become particularly important to me is recognizing what stuttering is like for the speaker. What's the speaker experiencing in that moment? A study that one of my colleagues, Dr. Seth Tishner and I published recently, asked adults who stutter what that moment of stuttering is like for them. And you know what? They didn't say stuttering is repetitions, prolongations, and blocks. That's a characteristic, that's a byproduct. But what they say is, stuttering is a moment when I feel stuck in what I'm saying. When I know exactly what I want to say, but in that moment, I'm not able to say it the way I want. And one of the most common words they used was unable, stuck. And another, the phrase loss of control. I feel like I've lost control of my speech. That's really what stuttering is. When people experience that loss of control, they understandably do things to try to regain control. Those things that they do, that's what we get to see as listeners. The repetition, the prolongation, the block, the eye blink, the head turn, all of that other stuff is people trying to cope with the fact that in that moment, they know what they want to say, but because of their unique neurological difference, they're not able to say it in that moment. So that's truly what that moment of stuttering is like. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. I remember when I heard you speak before, you talk about this loss of control or inability to have control, like you're walking out of your front door and there's black ice and you can't get your footing. Yeah. 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 And you do things trying to not fall, right? What the listener or the, the observable observer sees all that other stuff, they can't feel that slip that you felt. But that's really what started it all right? It's that loss of control that starts it all. And that's important to recognize because as we help people understand that that loss of control is not their fault, it's just the, their different brain wiring, then we can see therapy not as fixing something they're doing wrong, correcting their speech behavior, but rather as helping them learn to cope with the fact that they slip sometimes when they're walking. They get this moment where they can't quite get the words out the way they want, can they cope with that in an effective way so they can still communicate, right? It's a really important shift in our understanding of our role. Absolutely. Martha, did you have something to add? I was just gonna talk about, Scott just started to touch on it, the how it relates to work with our clients. I think the big shift for me was I had, or my largely my understanding when I became an SLP was that stuttering was all about fluency. And I think fluency is a part of it, but what I've learned is really working with people who stutter is working on communication. And that's the whole premise of our field anyway, but somewhere we got lost and felt like we had to help people not stutter, but really we're, our role is to help people communicate. And so I think verbal diversity relates to our work because now we're shifting to this idea that we're gonna help clients to feel more confident when they communicate. We're gonna help them feel more comfortable when they communicate. And so we're shifting our goals, but we're also shifting the way that we're constructing our therapy activities, the way that we're talking about stuttering in our rooms. It's a big, it's a big mental shift. We don't have to fix anything. We don't actually even have to change anything we're just supporting them so that they can go out in the world and say, hey, I'd like to order a coffee or whatever it is that they wanna say. Um, and that's really our role. And also 
changing from being a clinician and that clinical, I'm going to fix it, I'm going to make it better, to I'm just here to support you and your goals. Um, and that's a big, a big shift for us. Absolutely. And I think the, the old way of being is uncomfortable and the new way of being is such a gift. It's so wonderful yeah. to be able to support your clients and being the best communicators and feeling the best about their communication as possible. Excellent. Okay. okay. Our next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, it makes therapy so much more fun and more meaningful. Absolutely. And that connection that you get to have. I think earlier we were really talking about the humanity in building that rapport when you get to see your client as a human being who's communicating. And that's what, what we came into this field to do is to help people communicate. So yeah, it's really exciting. All right, our next question, pre-submitted question is, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of training in grad school related to stuttering. I usually refer potential clients out to others. What do you recommend I do to increase my confidence and competence in working with this population? Martha, why don't you take this because you've talked about sure. your shift. Sure, well, and I, I can relate to this because this was me too in the beginning. I was like, I do not feel confident. I don't feel competent. I think some things that helped me were this idea that I'm not fixing anyone or changing anyone. I'm supporting them. So shifting to what are your goals? Let me listen. Let's work on this together. We're collaborating. I think that takes kind of some of the pressure off of being the expert. You don't have to be the expert. You just have to be willing to collaborate and try to you know figure it out together. I think some of that flexibility is really important. I think a lot of SLPs are like, oh, stuttering. There's a lot of hard feelings there. We have to talk about feelings. And yes, feelings are a part of it. And so I think giving yourself the permission, like we're gonna talk about feelings and it's gonna be fine. It's okay. And that it is a part of it. Um, and that your, your clients will appreciate having a space where they can share their feelings. I think going into it knowing feelings are going to show up today makes it a lot easier than like, uh oh, like my client looks kind of sad, like, oh no. And knowing that you've created this positive space um, for emotions in your room is really, really powerful. Um, and then I think just learn as much as you can. I think a lot of SLPs don't get the training and stuttering that you get in other areas of our field. And so take the time to, i Scott and Nina, Stuttering Therapy Resources are amazing. Um, and they have tons of free materials. I reference them all the time and not just for, for clinicians, but for parents too. So looking at the materials in our field um, and seeing what's available, but also knowing I don't have to be the expert on this thing, but I know that I can find resources to learn and I'll learn with my client. Fantastic. Scott, anything to add to that? That was a terrific answer. Um, to take some of that pressure off yourself. Yeah, you don't have to fix anything. The most powerful thing that we can do as clinicians is be with our clients. That's it. I would much rather have somebody who knows how to listen than somebody who knows all the facts about stuttering. And if you can be with them and listen and learn from them and allow them to experience a different way of thinking about themselves. Um, it's it's tremendously rewarding. It really is. Although we face this situation, unfortunately, where so many speech language pathologists aren't comfortable with stuttering. It's the least favorite area for so many people. The reason that Nina and I started with Stuttering Therapy Resources was specifically to address that. In fact, if you go on our website, you'll find a blog post that's called uh, Increasing Our Confidence as Stuttering Therapists. <laughs> it's specifically about that. And you'll find that in all of our books and such is that that orientation that we know this has been a, been scary for you. you. We know you haven't felt that you got the training you know, that, you, that you wanted to have. However, you can do this. I am of the firm opinion that every clinician can be a superb stuttering clinician. Um, and, and mostly it has to do with learning to listen and learning to be with. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think too, the big piece we spoke about earlier is the par the parent piece and the education and support of the parents, because in society, there's still this idea that stuttering is something that you want to stop. And so I, I've had many a conversation with parents about stuttering and it being a difference. And I, I think that that is something that scares SLPs away from, from working with stuttering clients. Well, and I think that there are so many resources beyond us too. We do not have to be the person that deal that works with this family or is the expert on working with the this particular child. There's um, incredible support groups for parents out there. So lead on those. I always, um, I sign up for their newsletters and I'll just email them out to parents like, hey, I saw this and thought of you. And, um, and, and it's just great to you are inviting them not only to connect with you on this topic and to hear what, what your recommendations are, but look, there are other people you can connect with, um, I think is really, really powerful. That is such a great idea for sure. I mean, how many times have, have you said something to a, a parent and it doesn't register, but then they hear it from the second, from a second person. And it's like, Oh, I just heard this great thing. <laughs> and you think, Oh, I said that yesterday to you, <laughs> but it takes yeah. hearing it from multiple sources. So I, I really appreciate that idea, Martha. Fantastic. Okay. So our next question comes from Elisa. And Elisa wants to know, what is the ideal treatment plan and activities for older elementary students? So I think we've talked about rap rapport building and how important that is and listening. Scott, is there anything you would add in particular for older elementary students? Yeah, I think the key, and, and I understand where the question's coming from because so often clinicians will email me, I don't know what to do, what am I gonna do? And there's often that word do, and, and there's an activity, you know, what's the activity? Um, if we focus on how stuttering is affecting them, if we focus on identifying the adverse impact and minimizing that adverse impact, then our activities and our goals flow naturally from that. So for example, Let's say you identify that one aspect of the adverse impact that an older elementary student is experiencing is reading aloud in class. Okay, it's terrifying for, for kids who don't stutter too sometimes, but you know, you discover that that's where he's experiencing adverse impact, solving problems at the board, doing a book report, giving, uh, doing group work, things like that. Th th those real everyday things that they're doing, um, talking to friends at lunch, ordering you know, the food that they want in, in the school cafeteria or asking for you know, what they want, saying thank you, you know, whatever, whatever the things are that they identify. They've basically told you what your treatment plan is right? They're saying, I'm having difficulty doing this. And often it's because of the fear. I don't care whether they stutter on that or not. It's, it's, it's hard for me to do that. Well, then we focus our therapy on, well, how can we make it easier for you to say the things you want to say, to do the things you want to do? And when we shift away from thinking, oh, it's got to be about fluency. They got to practice this technique or that technique. It opens up a whole world because the question is, how can I help this kid be who he wants to be? How can I help him say what he wants to say? Remember, the reason we open our mouths to talk is not to be fluent, right? We do it in order to communicate. And if we can keep that in mind as we're thinking about our treatment plan, then our activities are just doing the things they wanna do you know, and helping them find it easier to do those things. Less fear, less tension, less struggle, less avoidance, less negative thoughts. Then that lightens, that lifts the burden of stuttering. Excellent. Martha, you work with mostly younger children, but do you have, is that correct? No, I, I also have some older elementary students as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree with Scott. I feel like going with that real wor world application is really important. I think anytime that you're, so I'm, when I was a school-based SLP, I was pretty like I need an activity, like we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about apples uh, cause it's fall and that's like what we're doing today. And I think give yourself permission to do something that feels kind of like play um, that, may, that is not structured. And I think your students with stutter will get a lot more out of it and probably the other kids on your caseload too. 
Um, I also think we, um, as SLPs, like want activities that are like, this says stuttering, so I can use this and I'll use it on this day and it'll go really well. You don't need to have activities that are geared towards stuttering to work on communication. You, you don't need that, I give you permission. Um, and there's no like ideal treatment plan because we've been talking today about how every kid who stutters is different. And so there's not gonna be one activity that's part like a knockout for your whole caseload. Um, and I think that's just really important to remember. So giving yourself permission to experiment, to play, and to have something that's unstructured, feeling a little bit maybe type B about it would would greatly benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, I think just, again, taking the pressure off of the SLP and those are the sessions when you're able to do that where you have the most fun and you can yes. reconnect to why you wanted to be a speech language pathologist. So that's great. Our next question comes from, oh, let's see from Zach. And Zach wants to know, how can we best support our clients who do not stutter during therapy, but may in life? Martha, would you like to take this one? Sure. Um, students or clients do not need to stutter in therapy to work on stuttering or communication. So you don't have to hear it to be able to work on it, because what you're doing is you're just su supporting their communication experiences outside the room. So what you're doing is you're talking about, you know, what spaces are you enjoying talking in right now? Where where are you feeling challenged? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about those moments. Um, and it's okay if during that conversation, you don't hear any stuttering. That just means that they're communicating with you. That's just what their voice sounds like in that moment. So it's not a prerequisite for therapy which I know is hard in some settings, but you're supporting their communication experience, not the stuttering. The stuttering doesn't need work, just their experience with it. That's a great perspective. Scott, anything to add? Beautiful. That. <laughs> <Great. laughs> this is awesome, this is so fun. Next question <laughs> is, from Jocelyn and Jocelyn says, how can I best support my adolescent client who has never received SLP services for his stutter? Martha, you wanna take this one? Sure, well, so I think I'm, there's a lot of different ways to answer this question. I don't know if it's coming from like, if it's a behavioral health specialist or if it's an mm -hmm. SLP, but this is an invitation to learn why, you know, or learn about their communication style. So are they happy with their communication? Are they saying what they wanna say? Have there been times in their life where they couldn't? So you're sort of doing an inventory because as Scott said earlier, just because you stutter, it doesn't mean that you need speech therapy. If you're having you know, positive communication experiences, we don't need to hang out. You're, you're doing great. <laughs> um, and so, so it is possible highly possible that someone could stutter all the way up to adolescence and not need speech therapy. Mm -hmm. And then Scott, do you have anything to add about the mental health side of things? If this question maybe came from a mental health practitioner? Or the, the question that I would want to ask, first of all, I, I agree with what Martha said. It was great. Question I would want to ask is, well, what's changed now? Why, why now? Why is he coming to therapy now? Is it that now the parents want him to, or is it that he wants himself to? And for adolescents, um, that, that's a difficult time to begin with. And so it's a time when even small differences feel magnified. So maybe the reason he's not been in therapy before is because he was feeling okay, and now all of a sudden he's not feeling okay. In which case, I don't know we've got a blank slate. We've got a we've got a, a clear opportunity to approach stuttering the way we would like it to be approached from the beginning. Or there may be other factors, and, and so if there are um, strong negative reactions, if there's strong fear, if there's avoidance. Um, well, then, you know, we're going to want to start pretty clearly with that message of, yes, you're in therapy now, okay, and you haven't been before, 
But that doesn't mean that there's all of a sudden something terribly wrong with you. It's still okay to stutter, right? If it may be, now sometimes, this doesn't happen often, but sometimes you could have late onset stuttering, stuttering that just starts later. Um, and in that case, it's particularly challenging because everybody, the speaker included, remember a time when they didn't stutter. And so it's really hard to come to terms with, with this new difference, this new loss is how it'll feel to them. I've lost my ability to be who I was to be. And there the message of acceptance is, I mean, it's always important, but it's extra important to say it's okay that now is different from before. So a lot would depend upon the situations, understanding why now, but being aware that adolescence is a time of, of great challenge anyway. So additional emphasis on, well, I mean, would teens do half the crazy things they did if they could just accept themselves more? I would, you know, if they could tolerate who they are, uh, life would be a lot easier for teens, but that's not what the teenage years are about. Right. I think the understatement of the years to say that teenage years are are challenging. Yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> go back for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. Question. The next question is from Elena. And Elena wants to know, can you speak to the connection between stuttering and social anxiety? That is mechanisms for each, comorbidity, et cetera. Scott, I see you nodding. Would you like to take this one first? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, it's just a topic that's been the subject of a lot of research. Once, once upon a time, people who stutter were believed to be anxious people, and that's why they stuttered, okay? So stuttering was believed to be a, a psychological problem, basically, and we know today that that's not the case. Today, instead, we know that stuttering can cause psychological problems, but not the other way around, right? So some people who stutter may well experience social anxiety. In fact, many may experience situational anxiety. It's understandable. If you don't know whether you'll be able to say what you want to say the way you want to say it, if you don't know how the other person is going to judge you, but you can guess that you've had negative experiences before and it could happen again, then it's understandable that you will be anxious. But it's important to recognize that for most people who stutter, that is, that is normal anxiety that they're experiencing, right? There are some people who stutter who will go on to experience clinical levels of social anxiety, probably due to the stuttering. It could be due to other things in their lives. People who stutter have other lives too, not just their stutter, right? They have the rest of their life. And so people who stutter have just as much right as the rest of us to have had adverse events in their lives that are non-speech related. So stuttering and clinical anxiety can co-occur, but it's not a given. Much of the anxiety that people who stutter experience is, is typical, understandable reaction to being placed in difficult situations and being faced with social stigma. Now, there's some debate about this. There is some research that suggests very high rates of clinical anxiety in people who stutter. There's debate about that research. There's, there's going to continue to be debate because a lot of it depends upon definitions. What's clinical anxiety? When is it, you know, just, just typical or when, it, when is it crossed that line? The bottom line for me as a clinician, though, is I, regardless of what label has been applied, I need to work with the person who's, who's in front of me, right? And understanding their unique constellation of experiences, their unique phenotype, if you will, of stuttering. That is a combination of who they are, what their history has been, what their experiences have been, who's around them in particular and what they want for their lives. Well, then, yeah, anxiety may be part of that. I have a scope of practice issue. If their anxiety is in response to things that aren't related to their stuttering, then I have to draw a line there and I work closely and always have with mental health professionals who can help with that aspect that's not speech related. But for the most part, the speech related stuff is within our scope of practice and provided we're trained, that's, that's part of what we're supposed to be working on. Excellent, I really appreciate that. Uh how you brought in that you collaborate and work with mental health practitioners. I think it's so important. And it, as Martha said before, emotions come up in this type of therapy. And, and it's important to know where our, where our scope of practice is and, and what we're able to support and help our clients with. 
Thank you. All right, our next question is from Elizabeth. What practices for targeting stuttering in early inter what are best practices for targeting stuttering in early intervention or the preschool age? Martha, what are some things that you do? I think you just want to be <laughs> I think you just, just want to be That's a careful. huge question. <laughs> yeah, I know it's huge. I guess the, where I would start is just to remember that when they're preschool age, the parents are so important. The parents are important forever, you know, in life, but they're so, so important at preschool. Um, and so to remember that as much as you are working with the child and playing with the child and doing maybe direct therapy with the child, that the parents are your partners at this stage and collaboration with them is really important. And so addressing their understanding, their knowledge of stuttering, their hopes and dreams for their child, affirming that their child is going to be fine um, those are all really important things at this stage, but I agree with you, Scott. I, we could probably talk about this for hours. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Anything to add, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> well, just just one thing. It, yeah, absolutely what Martha said. Um, but just one thing. There is a lot of a lot of times there's a focus in clinical discussions about one approach or another approach that there's differences between approaches. But more recently, a group of us have been thinking, especially about the preschoolers, about the commonalities across different approaches. Try not to get fixated on, well, I use this named approach or that named approach or the other named approach. There are they're out there. Uh, and that's fine. But when we look at what are the, the fundamental core aspects of therapy, even across approaches that on the surface seem to be quite different from one another, we find commonalities of involving the parents, of a belief in an outcome in which many children, though not all, will grow through that stuttering and ultimately go on to not stutter, a belief in the importance of communication, a belief in the importance of reducing fear surround, surrounding stuttering, a belief in the, in the fact that it's okay to address stuttering directly, whereas historically our field was afraid to do that. So when we look at what, what commonalities might be, what best practices might be, um, if we look to those fundamental principles, I have a paper coming out with uh, Kurt Eggers and Sharon, Mill Sharon Millard. Um, Sharon Millard is from the Palin Center, uh, and they use an approach that's similar to what I do, little, little differences here and there. But we've been focusing these last few years on, on a lot of the commonalities. And if we look past the name branding, we find that, oh yeah, I get my head around five or six principles. It seems overwhelming at first, but I can get my head around a few principles. And those principles seem to apply as common core, potentially active ingredients of the therapies that many, many people use. And that makes it a little easier for me, uh, at least as I approach early childhood starting, because it can be a little terrifying otherwise. Yes, absolutely. I think they're going back to this idea of pressure, I would venture to guess that a lot of SLPs feel a pressure to do things right in the early years so that they can set their clients on the path of not stuttering in the future. And I think this new, this idea of verbal diversity flips that on its head and takes the pressure off. Martha, could you speak to that a bit? Oh, I, well, I agree with you that I think that we know that some preschoolers, I guess it's complicated because some preschoolers might not continue to stutter, but I think sharing at an early age that even if they do, it's okay, that that this is maybe will be the way they talk or it won't be, but either one is fine, either outcome is fine and building that awareness at that stage so that the parents aren't like hoping that it goes away or, or maybe one day hoping that it stays, who knows, but that it's just accepted um, as what it is at that point in time. And so building that in your practice is this is I we're working together so that you feel comfortable that and that your child also feels comfortable and regardless of of what happens with their speech. Excellent. All right, we have time for another question. Um, this is from Daniel. How do I know when a referral to a therapist in behavioral health is warranted? And Scott, you spoke about how you work with mental health practitioners. Would you speak to this? You bet. 
um, there's two key factors that I think about. One is, is the issue that we're facing related to communication? Because if it is, it's in my scope of practice. If I'm competent to address it, that's not scope of practice, that's code of ethics, right? <laughs> so um, our code of ethics says that if we're trained in an area and we're competent in an area and it's scope of practice now, related to communication and swallowing and all those other things we do, um, then, then that's okay. I personally have a threshold for when I want to refer that is different from what anybody else's threshold might be, and their thresholds are different from everybody else's as well because of that personal con competence and that personal confidence component, right? So I, I've taken courses in counseling. I've taught counseling class for, you know, 20 whatever years now. I feel pretty comfortable in that domain and others may feel less comfortable. There are certainly others who are even more comfortable and even better trained and could um, handle maybe more, again, as long as it's related to our field, than I would, right? So it's a very personal thing. Daniel, if you are feeling like the issues that are coming up are no longer related to speech language pathology, well, then definitely want to refer. But if you're also feeling like, yeah, it's speech-related anxiety, but it's more entrenched, and the stuff that I'm doing isn't shaking it loose, then don't hesitate. I never hesitate to involve others um, because human beings are complicated. And, you know, again, they're more than just their stutter. And so if the stutter, you know, I can get kind of the stuttering stuff, fine. But wow, it's tapped into this whole other area of their life. Then I never hesitate personally. Uh, I never hesitate. And I find sometimes those conversations go as the, the psychologist or, or a counselor saying, yeah, you've got this. You don't need me. That's exactly what I'd, been, I'd be doing. And often they say, yeah, you know what? That's let's let's take a little bit of a different approach on that. And I've learned a lot that way. So, mm -hmm. excellent, Martha. I see you nodding your head. <laughs> I I would just say we're better together. Oftentimes, you know, I think that there's just tremendous benefit team approach. And so I think if you're if you're in a therapy session and you're like, gosh, I wonder if they would benefit, they probably would. And I think also connecting with you're a behavioral health specialist in your area and saying, hey, I have this client and obviously being, you know, professional and, and HIPAA compliant and everything. But do you think this is something that you could support with and just seeing if it's in their scope? I mean, I think Scott was talking about considering our scope, but also considering the scope of others, too, um, and seeing whether that team approach would best serve that client. So doing your own sort of research on what would most benefit your your client in terms of a referral. Yeah, that great points. I really appreciate that. So we're going to move on to our final thoughts. Thank you both so much for sharing your perspectives and experiences. Our time's almost up and I'd like to just have you touch on anything that we didn't bring up or that you'd like to elaborate more on. I'll turn it over to Martha. If there's something that we didn't ask that you think would be really important to highlight, please let us know. Well, I think tomorrow is International Stuttering Awareness Day. I think if you're here with us today or you're watching tomorrow, you're already participating in it in some way. But thinking about how can you make your space more welcoming for people who stutter? What can you do as a, as a clinician starting today or tomorrow, depending on your time zone? What can you do to um, take some of the things that, that Scott and I were talking about and make your, your therapy more exciting for you, more comfortable for you, but also then for your client? I think take the opportunity to do that for yourself. Absolutely. Thank you, Martha. And Scott, any final thoughts? The four most important words to me that people can learn about stuttering, it's okay to stutter. And we have to believe that in our core so that we can convey that to other people, parents, teachers, and our students themselves. And it, it may not be what you were taught. It may not be where our field has been, but it's where our field is going. 
And that doesn't mean we're giving up on people. It doesn't mean we're just saying, ah, you know, just let yourself go. It's nothing like that. It's helping to affirm people for who they are and how they are. And wow, we could all use that, whatever our issue is. And we have an important role to play, no matter what our background or training was. Every speech language pathologist can help to contribute to a world in which people who stutter feel more accepted. And that will help them learn to better accept themselves. That's really fantastic. Thank you so much for being here today, Martha and Scott. It was Thank such a pleasure you. and an honor to be with you both today. And I hope that everything that you've talked about today, that sharing about stuttering and verbal diversity has raised awareness and acceptance of stuttering. And we'll all go out into the world and say, it's okay to stutter. And I urge everyone in attendance to spread the word and support verbal diversity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Yeah, I appreciate it greatly. Thank you.